Watson, what's going on? What is going on? Hey, Sam, good morning. Bob Schumann, first in, as per usual. Bob Schumann has, I think, uh, IMDb red or something, so he doesn't get ads. I'm so glad. Hey, uh, John, where, John Y., where did you go for your uh, holiday, Christmas? I'm assuming to see family, or was it more of like a, let's go some more warm kind of thing? That's right. The game's tonight. I don't even know if I'll remember to watch it. I don't think I've watched the last 10 of them just because I forget that it's even a thing. George is going to win anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm guessing. Obviously, it's all I can do. Why did I take the tuner off? I don't know why I took my tuner off because it's not tuned. funny though, when you, the tuner will say it's in tune, but when you play the chord, it's like, nope, not in tune. Because the, a true, you want to know what a real major third sounds like. This is, this is sharp. Yeah, so this is or the tuner, not a very precise tuner, but I think that's 17 cents flat from a G sharp. The, the tuner says it's a G sharp. So tempered tuning would be like using the harmonics. Like even, even the fifth. So that's why when you play a chord, tune it and you play an E chord. It's still, it's still not quite right. You know, anyway. Um, that's one of the drawbacks. Of, now, they make tempered tuning fret boards. I've seen them, you know, where the frets are kind of like moving all over the place. They're not like a straight line like these. They're kind of jagged for perfect intonation up and down the fretboard. I don't know if I could get used to that. I should try to play one and see. I might be like, it might be a problem because I might like it so much that I can't play any other guitar. Um, you were the first to click, <laughs> so you're like first. Thanks, Jeff. We're going to keep talking about chord embellishments and things like that. We're going to kind of continue on the acoustic I may pick up the electric at some point but we're going to kind of we're going to talk about um uh, sus sus tones and uh or suspicious tones and uh, you know suspended tones uh many that you know and then it just uh, again it's one of those things where I'm like good to know the notes on your fretboard and it's good to start learning a little bit of theory um you don't need to know a plagal what a plagal cadence is or uh, you don't need to learn figured bass um, or anything like that, but it, it is good to know what chords are in the key of E, um, and then what are their, each of the chords suspended tones. What are the to well? What are the tones in the chords? The one three fives, and then what are the two four sixes? <clears throat> so when you learn the one three five of any chord, um, it's not too difficult to figure out the two two four six, especially if you know the key. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And that was what I was doing at the, when I was just kind of playing at the beginning of the video. Um, I was just taking an E chord, an A chord, and a B chord, just kind of adding. Sus4. So
and I'll do it uh, sus4 out of the key for A. And that goes kind of like a So the, the, um, uh, so what I'm doing there is just kind of sussing notes. We weren't talking about that. Okay, John was asking, Jack, or Jack, sorry, Jack Lloyd. Boy, I didn't see that question. Thank you, Bruce, for keeping tabs. Hey, Wendy, what's going on? Uh, oh, Jack Lloyd. Where? Where the heck is that question, Bruce? Was that from? Uh, oh, was that from? Uh, Discord, Jack. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, yeah. So people say, oh, you know, D's a good key for me. No, not necessarily. For, voice, for singing, uh, it, the key of the song has nothing to do, or the key has nothing to do with your vocal range. Zero. The range of the song has to do with your vocal range. Your, your vocal range is a pretty fixed thing. And uh, you go, oh yeah, D is great for me because I can sing this D and I can sing this, you know, I can sing la, la, and that's true for me. That's my range. And right now I'm, my, I'm kind of froggy today, um, so I don't even think. Yeah, that's pretty high. You know, I, I can almost get that one because it's early in the morning. But um, but let's just say your range is D to D. To D. Again, let me get the tuner out. Um, that your range is, like I said, fixed. There is no key that is good for your voice. Because if that song, the range of the song went from A to A, you'd be out of luck because you wouldn't be able to hit this A note, you wouldn't be able to hit this G note, this F sharp note, this E or this, you know, you'd be able to get the D, but, you know, if the melody was... You, yeah, that's D would be an awful key for you. But if you transpose the song to G so that that A to A became D to D, now you're perfect. What would it be? A... Would it... That's all in your range. So the key has nothing to do with your range. It's it's the key of the song or the range of the song that fits your range. And so you may have to move things around. Um, you know, when somebody says you learn a song in the key of C and somebody says, that's too high, I need to do it in B flat. Well, you could go, okay, well, I know it in C. So that means I have to capo here at the 10th fret, which is almost impossible, and play C shapes. And you're like, yeah. You know, it sounds silly. It sounds like a mandolin. Um, so that's where you need to learn how to transpose songs, and you would really probably want to, if you need to transpose a song down to B flat, you're probably going to just play G shapes, but you need to learn the songs. Um, you need to be maybe be able to transpose the, or convert the chords of the songs into a number system, like a Nashville number system. Somebody asked me that on a, on a YouTube question. Um... Uh, oh, sorry, Bruce. Thank you for... <laughs> I forgot. I, we put a category up on Discord. Questions for Tom on Discord. Tom never checks. Questions that Tom will never check on Discord. Oh, not Discogs. Where's Discord? I got a link here somewhere. There it is. Yeah, I like Discogs better than All Music for checking that. So All Music won't give me my credits. Questions for Tom. Ah, right there. Look at that. Um, oh, where does Tom, I generally hear, Dave, um, 
Wow, that that goes way back. <laughs> Sorry, is Jack in the house? Jack's here though, right? So okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you can harmonize. And Ron or Ben, one of my favorite tricks, and I did a video on this a long time ago. So you probably see me with different hair, uh, like younger eyes, <laughs> different glasses for sure. Um, but it's called sing a string. It's one of my favorite tricks. And you know, I wrote a lot of songs. But my wife and I had a band. We did three records and. Uh, never, never, never sold enough to break even on any of them. But one of the things that, you know, like if the melody, whatever the melody is, say we're in a key of G, if you just pick a string that's really good for you, um, then you can just sing whatever notes on that string. And it may create kind of a droney melody. Like if we go, the song goes from G to C, it's still a G to D, E minor, D, I like, I like, there's, we've talked about this before, there's different kinds of harmonies, um, and this touches on your range and keys and things like that, but uh, you can have a harmony that's pure, like thirds, or, you know, moving parallel harmony, like... That's kind of boring. You could also have... A, is the melody say and that's can be boring to sing but it's almost more interesting to have that drum so I can that a so when the note when the, when my chord changes and that note when a note on the string changes you follow that note so my harmony for G C E minor D could be as simple as G G G A and that's just kind of a great way to maybe if you're I mean I've done this where you're just like hey let's do a song and somebody starts singing a song and you're like okay you're learning the chords and you they're singing and you don't know the melody very well and you want to kind of add something to it vocally. And so you can do that. I call it sing a string. But it also is a good way to come up with a harmony or a part for a song. Um, there's also, um, uh, uh, so we've got parallel harmonies. You've got contrary motion harmonies. Uh, you know, like uh, if you were to do, um, what is it? One second is going. And the other one's going. Oh, you're getting rhythm. They start out unison, then they go to a minor third, they go to a fifth, and then they go to octaves. You know, those that would be contrary motion harmonies. Um, you, could, I really like drone harmonies. Um, Melody, but on top, I, I don't know. I think it's John. Is it? He's just singing an E note. Would be my guess that's John. John liked very uh, monotone melodies. Like you listen to a lot of his songs that he writes. Uh, when I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. He would he would really milk a, a, a melody tone, but the chords would change, so it would make that melody more interesting. For example, if I were to take a G note, okay, and I'll play, well, like the one note samba is that way, but. Oh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I can, I can pin your comment there. Pin message. Thanks, Bruce. I forgot. I woke up so sleepy this morning. <laughs> it's what I get for taking NyQuil. I was like, uh, I felt like I had a scratchy throat last time. I'm like, okay, I'll take some NyQuil to get good sleep. 
that makes it so hard to get up in the morning. I'm not like, I don't, I rarely take any medications at all. Like ibuprofen every now and then. <laughs> what's that? What's that? Is it Vim, Vim diagram where the, you know, you got the three circles and they over, over. <laughs> and it's like, I'm vegan. I do CrossFit, something else. And then the, the overlap is I never stop talking. <laughs> And it's funny because we Beth and I started cold plunging. So I'm like, I'm telling everybody we're cold plunging. Like, why am I telling everybody we're cold plunging? But um, cold plunging is just get you know get, getting into really cold water for you know three or two, three, four or five minutes. And our pool's gotten down as cold as 48 degrees. Um, it's not quite cold plunger tubs usually take the well if you put ice in them it can get down below freezing i think salt water i know can get below freezing because it doesn't freeze at 32 like fresh water does but um it's supposed to be good for your inflammation and stuff like that so i i don't really have any issues per se but you know the older i get or I, playing guitar for a living makes my makes it me real sensitive to any changes in any inflammation i might have inflammation in my knee and not notice it but if i have inflammation in my index finger or my pinky or my third finger or something like that, especially on my left hand, I'll definitely feel it. So I'm always doing, I haven't done a video on this. I've talked about it with you guys. I'm always just kind of doing little, you know, mini, mini yoga things for my hands. <laughs> but I don't want to do a video on it because I don't want to say this is helpful because I don't want anybody to hurt their hand. Um, but I do have kind of a routine of things I do, you know, just in the morning to kind of get things going. And to make sure that I've got full mobility and flexibility in my fingers. Paul Meyer, good morning. Um, yeah, we've got more rain. We've had more rain and I think our average rainfall is 14 inches and we've already gotten that. <laughs> Just so far this year. So, and they still, the drought's never going to end. They're never going to say the drought's over. It's Just they, they're not going to do it. They don't want people watering their yards again. Um, but my grass is green right now. Uh, let's see. So, um, yeah, so the, so when you, you want to look at the range of the song. So like if I, it's not unusual, like I always tell you when I'm doing, you know, like I've, I've got a lot of, uh, I'm doing a lot of sessions right now and a lot of music and this, uh, this is actually the bass. But one of the things that I do when I look at a piece of music, uh, let's see. take like this for example okay you can see right here a lot of chords in there um, but it's uh, video game oh, this is us and um, one of the things I'll do is I'll look at the range of the the lowest note in the especially if it's a lot of single note line reading you know I'll look at what's the lowest note okay this D and then the highest note oh this D and I'll, I may if I only have to get up to that D, then I might stay in this range, or I might move to here. If it's major, I might be here. Uh, but that way, I can keep my eyes on the paper, and I not have to look at my hands, because my hands are not going to go anywhere if I make sure that every note um, in the music that I'm reading is in between you know, or find the highest and lowest note, make sure it's in the range of where I'm playing the, the position. So I call it, you know, that would be position playing. Now, uh, I don't always do that because sometimes you want maybe this low, I want the sound of this D instead of the sound of this D, or the sound of this A instead of the sound of this A, or uh, if they want, you know, I want some slides in there and make it more, less like a computer, then I might move my hand around. So anyway, that's, 
Um, but the same thing is true when you're when you're learning a song or trying to put a song in your range. You, you want to first know your range, and then secondly, you want to know the range of the song. And so if the song is in the key of D and it goes from A to A, that's great for you know an alto uh, or maybe a tenor, but not great for a bass and uh, someone who sings more in the baritone range. So you may, if that song is in the key of A, going from A to A, you might want to move that song to the key of D. But see, the range of a song isn't root to root. It could be fifth to fifth. And again, this is where a little bit of theory comes in handy. So if, that, if the melody is fifth to fifth, um, then the key of A you know, would be maybe good because it would be E to E, because E is the fifth of the key of A. get that E, uh, yeah, if you can get that E up there, uh, then you might be fine. Uh, I can get that E down there, no problem right now. Um, but you may go, okay, I need to move that down another whole step and then move it to the key of G. Uh, now, it may change a lot of the, you know, if the song is like, hard to get that kind of sound out of the key of G, right? You know, it's like... quite sound the same but some something's got to be sacrificed for the song to be in your key um, and and you know probably half the time you're picking songs that are in your key anyway if it's songs that you sing along with and you can do it then that's your key but if the if there's a song you want to do and it's like man this song is too high or too low or whatever you're gonna have to move that and um, and if you look at the you know, if you have music for it, you can look at it and go on the melody. You can go, oh, there's the lowest note. Okay, the lowest note is A, um, and the highest note is C sharp. Okay, so uh, okay, I can get those notes. Okay, good. So you'll be fine. But if the lowest note was say a C and the highest note was a G, you might be like, mm, that might be hard. Well, that's a pretty broad range for a song. Very few songs would have that wide of a range. Um, Beethoven, uh, Beethoven seventh is that seventh? Um, uh, that um, that's a very narrow range. Although it does mm, it does go down to the fifth, but but it's very very narrow range on that melody, which is really nice. Um, and so, if you're writing songs, obviously you're going to write songs that, that are in your range. But hopefully that uh, kind of answers the question. You're going to have to figure out your range, figure out the range of the song, and then transpose the song to fit that range. You really don't want to be caught off guard on a song and have and and um, when you get to the bridge, like oftentimes bridges are the highest part of songs, especially '80s songs. And you get to that bridge and you're like, "Oh my God!" I gotta do it. You know, and we've all seen. <laughs> well, I love the uh, uh, what is it, Carl Lewis singing the national anthem? We've all seen that where he starts and that's like the classic example. I mean, if you're gonna sing the national anthem, you want to go. Oh, say, you want to get almost at the bottom of your range. Oh, say. So that would be. So, um, so yeah, you really want to be aware of that. And, and Carl Lewis starts too high. He goes, oh, say, can you see? And then when he gets to the, the, the the end of that section, he's like, he goes, stops, and he goes, uh-oh. <laughs> it's the funniest thing. He's like, uh-oh, I picked the wrong key. <laughs> I don't know what he was singing for. It was like some NBA game, or I don't know what it was. Uh, let me look it up. I can post it. I don't think there's any copyright worries on this one. But if you haven't seen it, it's pretty, pretty, pretty hilarious. My friend Tim Kepler and I, every time we're together, we, because uh, Tim sings the national anthem for a lot, for, he's the, he sings pretty much for every game, every uh, Mighty, uh, Mighty Ducks, uh, Anaheim Ducks games. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks like a major, yeah, it looks like a major uh, sporting event.
Okay, so I won't play it, but oh my gosh. Yeah, he probably should have dropped an octave mid song. Jose, can you see exactly? Um, but dang, I put a link to it there. <laughs> you can watch it. It's just like, yeah, the best part is when he goes, uh oh. <laughs> I guess. I mean, that's National Anthem 101. I, uh, Kelly, the girl I write songs with, uh, she sings, she just sang the National Anthem at something. I forget what it was. But she's done the Dodger games. Um, yeah, it's, I, I couldn't do it. I, I'd forget the lyrics. <laughs> and I, and the range is like, no, no, don't ask me to do it. I'm not doing it. Our uh, friend Suzanne from church, my kind of my boss from church, she did it at the Dodger game one year. Because our church, we would go to the Dodger game every year, and we, we would buy like 5,000 tickets or something like that. So they, you know, they would introduce us, and, the, you know, when you buy that many tickets, they're going to let you, you know, give you some perks. I think our pastor got to throw in the first pitch, um, and then Suzanne got to sing the national anthem. It was, she, I think she was really nervous. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's one of those things that that's a classic example of know your range. Um, so, uh, now I want to talk about some, we're still talking about embellishment, chord embellishments, fills and riffs, and they all, all those definitions are kind of squidgy for me. Um, chord embellishments is more something that happens while you're strumming the chord. Like that E sus thing. Okay, well, let's talk about the E chord. One of the th one of the things, like I said, you, if you know your fretboard, um, and you can start down here, you can do one string at a time. Almost better to do it by maybe learn it, learn the fretboard by uh, position, uh, but uh, almost a more need to know kind of thing. If you're if you play all e open chords, you never go up the fretboard, and you really don't need to learn the fretboard. Now maybe the reason you're not going up the fretboard is because you don't know anything up. It's like it's unnavigated, uncharted waters. Um, and so you're afraid to go up there, then maybe you do need to learn your fretboard. By learning your fretboard, I mean learn all the notes on the fretboard. I'll give you a little secret, a little trick that I've used back when I was a kid to learn my finger, my fretboard. But if you don't, if you're not going to use it, you're probably going to lose it, right? If you if you go all the trouble to memorize your fretboard and you still only play down here, you're probably not going to util, you're going to forget all of that. So it's going to be wasted effort, and wasted time. Um, so, but there's. There's definitely advantages to knowing the notes on your fretboard because I can I can look at this and go, okay, I know that's an E chord because somebody taught it to me and said, here's an E chord, play this. Okay, boom, okay, now I got that. What are the notes here? Okay, I don't know. 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 Still, I don't know. This just never sounds in tune to me. It's the temper, temper tuning. I don't know why I'm putting a tuner on. That tuner's not going to help. But anyway, um, it's that interval right there. Anyway, the uh, but if you do know what the notes are, you know this is E, B, E, G sharp, B, and E, and you know this is the root. And then a little bit of theory, like a, a major chord has a one and a three and a five. You know this is the one, five, one, three, five, one. And then, then you go to the next step, and it's like, okay, what's the, what's the, if E is the one, what's the two? Well, that's F sharp. So if you put your pinky on the top string at the second fret, you're getting. That's a nice little chord embellishment, but it can also be a fill. Is the second so again like I said we need to learn what the one the three and the five are and then if we learn what the two four, four and six are then we can do all sorts of embellishments on top of the chords uh, the other two is here at the fourth fret of the fourth string and that's a little bit tougher to get to but this one is easy If 
I do the same thing on the second string, that's a six. So we have the one, which is E, the three, which is G sharp, and the five, which is B. So the two is F sharp, and then the six is C sharp. So I can... So the pinky's gonna be really busy on that E chord. But I could also add the two above this five. I mean, I'm sorry. I could add the six, which is, again, C sharp. I could add that over this B here. And... It's the exact same suspension that's happening here. Morning, Jan. Hey, David. Thanks, Bruce, for making everyone feel welcome. Hey, Wendy. Yeah, Willie Nelson might be one of those artists that has a really common strumming groove. I should I should do some research on that and see if I, you know, Willie Nelson's favorite strumming groove. Because I'd love to do another one of those videos. I just have a hard time finding anyone that's really kind of very, very consistent with their strumming grooves or has one that they really gravitate towards. Uh, I tried with Dylan and Tom Petty and Johnny Cash, and I just couldn't. Johnny Cash might have that feel. The I could I talked about last week. I could do Bo Diddley. And that brings me to the next suspension, which is the the most common suspension when we think of of sus chords is the four to three suspension. So that would be, again, with the pinky on the third string, second fret. Nice little embellishments you could do over the E chord that we arrived at by learning, by knowing a little bit of theory, it's chord theory. Um, now, the other, the other one, the, the, I could do the two one suspension here. That one's a little bit harder. So you play E and then you do an E two chord, which I'm playing E, B, F sharp, G sharp, open, open. So it's open. Two, four, one, open, open. It's a great chord. It's just not easy to grab if you're not really adept with your pinky. I can really feel this muscle right here getting a workout when I play it. You can see it like looks like Popeye right there. Um, well, I'm going to show you my fret, learning the fretboard trick. Uh, is there a method? Well, I, I, I remember, here was, let me write down this E2 chord. Now we got 35, 38. Come on, we can get up to 40. Um, so that E2 chord here, let me just type it in. 0, 2, 4, 1, 0, 0. That's what I was playing. Um, and those, actually those numbers happen to correspond to your fingers. That doesn't always, that's not always the case, but it, but it is. Okay, so we talk, so I talked about learning the fretboard. Okay. This is a trick, I, and I did a video on this a long time ago. But what I do as a kid is I, I put together, I had a little box, and I, I cut up little pieces of paper and wrote on those pieces of paper different, uh, the, all the possible notes that you could hit. So like E and F, F sharp, and then on another piece of paper I wrote G flat. Okay, so I, I, I would learn both versions of, you know, the, that's called being enharmonic. F sharp and G flat are the same note. So if you say, well, if I play this and you say G flat, that's correct. If I play this and you say F sharp, I'd say that that's correct. Both would be a correct answer. Then here's G, and I wrote down G sharp, and I also wrote down A flat. And I wrote down A, and then A sharp and B flat, B, C. I didn't do B sharp or C flat. Those, you know, those are pretty rare. So, uh, but B, C, C sharp, or D and D flat, D, D sharp and E flat. And all total, I think that's 17 notes, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So 
total of 17 notes, all right? So let's say I randomly, and, and what you wanna do, you wanna not use any open strings. And you just randomly um, pull out a note. So let's say we pull out a C first time. Okay, so now we gotta find a C on each string and go in order from the low string to the high string, okay? So we gotta find a C, well this is E. And the thing you want to know to, to start all of this is um, that uh, the, the musical alphabets A, B, C, D, E, F, G, there's no H, not, not in, at, outside of Germany, there's no H note. In Germany, they have an H, but we, uh, the rest of the world just goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then remember that B to C is a half step, one fret. And E to F is a half step. So if you remember BC like before Christ and EF as an EF Hutton, which of course doesn't exist anymore. And so I don't know how there's got to be another way to remember EF. Um, but those would be one fret. Everything else is going to be two frets. So A to B is two frets. C to D is two frets. D to E is two frets. F to G is two frets. G to A is two frets. Everything else is two frets. The others are one fret. And then the other thing you want to know is... Um, if it's if it's a flat you go down a fret if it's a sharp you go up a fret so a flat moves the note that way a sharp moves the note this way okay but we pulled out of the box we pulled a c out so we got to find a c on the low e string so you're gonna go okay here's e f is e f is a half step g okay g to a that's a whole step so two frets a to b is a whole step so two frets B, C, that's one of our half steps, so there, there's C. All right, so I found C on the low E string, and it took me a while, and that's fine. Okay, next time it won't take you so long. Okay, then we go next string. Okay, well, open A, kind of helps if you know the names of the open strings, too. Eat at Denny's, get bad eggs. Um, so there will be a quiz on this. <laughs> so take a reverse sip. What are enclosures? I mean, how do... Enclosures. I have never heard the term enclosures except reference referencing speaker enclosures. Sorry. Uh, if you maybe I don't know. Can you post a link, or did you have a teacher call them that? Because you know teachers will make up their own nomenclature for things. I've done it all my life as a teacher. I've made up things and you know ways to explain stuff, and people thought, oh, that's how it what is called. And it's like, no, it's just the way I explained it. So I'm not sure what enclosures are. Um, so we're on the A string and we're trying to find a C. So we go A and then A to B is two frets. So go to the second fret. B to C, that's one of our half steps and there's our C. Okay, so we had here and here. All right. Okay, the D string. Okay, D. Oh man. D, E, F, G, A, B, C. That's a long way. Oh, we could go backwards. Oh, here's D. And then down a whole step is C. Oh, there's C right there. So I just found C going this way instead of going all the way this way. I could go D, E, F, G, A, B, C, or I could just go D, C. Sometimes you might figure it out that way. It's totally fine. Shortcuts are fine. If you create, invent, find a way to shortcut it, and you still learn the fretboard, then what do I care? <laughs> right? If you still learn the information, yeah, reverse it. If you still learn the information, it it's it's irrelevant how you came about it. Now, I, I don't necessarily I don't necessarily agree with that on math. Like what was the thing the thing now is like, you know, math, it's like if you get the answer right, but you're 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 all of all of the formulas and everything was wrong, uh, you know, all that means is you probably got the answer key and you just knew the answer. Uh, so they need to see the formulas. Uh, I don't need to see your formulas. Okay, now we're on the G string. So we know that there's a C here, a here, and here. Uh, we don't. We may not memorize that the first time, right? It's not the first time, uh, but eventually we'll. So here's G, G, A, B, C. So that's not too far. G, whole step A. Uh, a to B is a whole step, and then a half step. To C. Oh, there's C right there. Oh, look at that. Oh, look. Here's the C. Oh, there's that octave. Okay. Oh wait, there's that octave. That. Oh. Oh, I'm seeing patterns. Oh, look. Okay. Now we have C on the B string. Well, that's easy. B, and then one fret up is C. Okay, and then the E string. Oh wait, we already did the E string. It's the same as this one. So if you know this one, you'll know that this is C if you remembered it from five minutes ago. <laughs> okay, so it may take you five minutes to find those Cs. 
I don't think it'll take you five minutes, but it may take a minute. And so, you know, you... So now we know where all the C's are. Now we pick out another random note out of the box and we get, it says E flat. I'm like, oh no, E flat. Well, here's E, oh, wait, if that's E, this is E. And if I flat E, I go that way, so there's E flat. Okay, well, you found E flat really quick this time. Um, and then be, so on and so forth. So the idea is to, is to kind of hunt, destroy, go in order down the strings. Don't randomize, necessarily randomize the strings. Um, and uh, slowly but surely, you'll start to learn the fretboard. Now, um, and you do that, you go through that stack of, you know, 17 cards. You could make, you know, note cards up. You can do little pieces of paper like I did. I would go through that box every day one time. Just one time. Just go through it every day one time. And every, hey, Christ, Christina, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh <laughs> yeah, there you go, Quail. Yeah, well, Quail, you teach, so you, you probably have a method. Effie and hard to think of something for that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I said, back when I first started teaching, there was all these commercials. When E.F. Hutton says, or when E.F. Hutton speaks and everybody listens, you know, stops what they're doing. Um, so... Learning the fretboard now, what that helps you do, for example, let, let's say I want to play an A chord and I want to know uh, some embellishments, or let's say I want to play, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to D chord, okay? Um, I know here's a D, here's an A, here's a D, here's an F sharp, here's a, um, an A, another A, a fifth, and I can go to the root, to the second, slide up to the third, hit the fifth, you know. Five, six, seven, or five, six, one, two, one. Very Jimi Hendrixy. So Jimi Hendrix would do that. He would take bar chords and he would look all the notes and he'd go, okay. He would know all of the susses over it. He would know the triad. D, A, D, F sharp, A. And you can learn this and not necessarily understand the theory. You can figure this stuff out. And the great thing about using bar chords to figure out things like this is that it's completely movable. E flat. You can totally move it around and not have to know anything what you're doing. And, and just so you know, when I'm playing stuff like that, I'm not sitting here going, okay, root, second, third, fifth, sixth, root, second, third, fourth. No, I just know that those notes work, but I may have derived them or come to knowledge of those through theory. But once you do that, you can forget, you don't have to think about theory all the time. It's not, playing guitar is not like that. You use theory as a tool to write, to analyze, and to come up with ideas. And then, you know, stuff just becomes part of your voice. And so with Jimi Hendrix, you know, it's like. You know. And he may have experimented and discovered those things on his own without knowing any theory. I don't know. But. Um, but he's not, I, I know he's not thinking, okay, this is a B minor seven chord, and then this is the, 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 the fourth of that, and then I go to the, I'm going to hit the third and the fifth, and then I'm going to hit the root and go down to the seventh. No, he's not thinking that. Um, uh, he, he may have, when he came up with these ideas, I'm like, oh, these notes are good, and I will do that too. I'm like... So you, I'm using a little bit of theory and my knowledge of the fretboard to kind of 
go, oh, okay, I wonder what this sounds like. But ultimately, you want to get natural enough at it so it doesn't sound like you're fishing when you're fishing, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I, I can tell when I'm when I'm listening back to a solo I played or something like that. We t I talked about this. Remember, we, I was doing solos on that Toto song? And... Um, or that Toto-esque song that I wrote. And and I was listening back and go, yeah, I like that phrase, but it sounds like I'm hunting or fishing. I can hear myself like going, I wonder if this is going to work and then trying something. Um, you might not have heard it, but I know my plane and I know, okay, I was hunting there. Uh, let me play that now again because it worked, but I could tell I was like not sure it was going to work when I hit it. And so now let me let me hit it let me play it with intention so that's kind of the transition that happens um you go from thinking okay i got an e chord oh i can do this note sus and then oh i could do the six oh i could also do this that second up there to the one i could also go up to the third or i could go the first time you do it you might be fishing like oh i hope this works and you're not you know, there's some, some hesitancy there there's maybe you get there early you get there late you know it's the timing isn't great but then the next time around you're like okay that worked now i can do it what's happening when you start to learn the fretboard and you start to learn theory and again if you're not going to be playing up here you may not necessarily need to learn that because it's going to be a waste of time you're not going to use it but you might find that if you learn the fretboard you're going to go you're going to venture away from the open positions a little bit more last week we talked about you can watch last week's video uh, it was funny because i went back to last week's video to see oh shoot did they put ads every five minutes and they didn't they put like two ads at the very end i'm like what the heck i was youtube it was like change their game so uh, I was like bummer I didn't make any ad revenue off that video but um, at least people didn't have to like uh, wait for the ad stand um, the art of fishing without fishing exactly yeah yeah it's it I the thing Ben on that is is um, that I would call, it, call kind of say that that's being in the zone, and this is true of any skill, whether you're playing tennis, golf, whatever, um, baseball, you know, football, whatever. You get in that that zone where everything's working, and then it's like, how do I get there? Like you may arrive there and look, dang, I don't even know how I got here, and you and it may be months before you can get there again. And you're like, dang it, I I remember that time I took that solo, and it was like, man, was I in the zone on that thing. And it is, it's like this, almost this headspace. Like for me, when I'm doing a solo on a record, um, and it, it's pretty rare. I mean, I'll do solos on TV stuff, you know, and that even then they don't really, it's very rare to get asked to put a solo on a track, to be honest. Um, you know, pop music, I mean, back in early 80s when everybody was putting guitar solos on pop tracks because of Beat It and Eddie Van Halen, um, but that didn't really, you know, that didn't carry over for the next, you know, 50 years or whatever. How long has it been since Beat It's been, oh my gosh, it's been over 40 years. Uh, yeah, that record is 40 years old. It came out 40 years ago. In fact, what's today? The night. Okay, so I think, I think Thursday is my anniversary from either when I left Indiana. To, I think I arrived in California on January 13th. Uh, 1983 so I will have been here 40 years as of January 13th but um, but when I'm doing solos um, there are several things that I, I try to do to get myself in the zone for one thing get a tone that's inspiring 
a tone that really makes you can always change the tone later. Well, you in when you're playing on a, a recording software and you're using plug-in amps, you can always change the tone later. So if you've got a tone that has a lot of delay and reverb, to just that sounds lush and big and huge and, and all that, uh, you can always tone that down when you you know, they may want to tone it there, or they may even want the DI, the direct signal, so they can reamp it on their end. But you may, you can always tone all that down. That's the beauty of recording what we call in the box. Okay, when I'm recording direct into um, my digital audio workstation, which I use Logic primarily, not primarily, I use Logic. Um, and, uh, uh, but I use different amps, like I use, main, my main amp is Guitar Rig by Native Instruments. And it's got billions of different options, so it's unlimited. But the um, I'll get a tone that I really like that inspires me, and then I may tone it down before you know turn down some stuff. Maybe I'll I'll put you know less reverb or less delay, or maybe darken it up or brighten it up or whatever. Maybe um, go that way. But first thing I need is an inspiring tone. The second thing I need is I need a good mix. So if my guitar is too loud when I'm soloing, I'm going to be much more hesitant, much more self-conscious, right? If it's too quiet, I'm not really going to be able to hear myself and I'm not going to hear the nuance. Or I'm, And so I may not add nuance because it's not going to be like the slides and the bends and you're going to, or the pick, the sound of the pick and all that. Um, you're not going to hear that. Um, and so if, if the, so what you want to do is make sure that, you know, and if you're working in a studio with an engineer or whatever, you need to, it's like being, a, this is exactly the same thing is true for singers. You need to get an inspiring sound in your headphones. You need to get the right mix where you're hearing yourself, not too loud, not too quiet, but right in that spot for you. That's perfect for you. Not what someone tells you is perfect. No, for me, this is, this is where I like it. And it may be a learning curve. It may take you a while to figure out, okay, this is really where I, Feel the most comfortable singing or playing at this level and then the other thing for for me sometimes if i'm doing a rock song i may stand up to play the solo so i you know i'm usually sitting down when i'm working i don't have a standing desk um I, i'm sitting down all day which is a bummer but but um i try to get up quite a bit i haven't done it in what an hour now but um if I'm doing a rock thing, I might stand up, which means the guitar's gonna be a little lower, but it kind of also makes you, you kind of have a little bit more of that attitude, right? Now, um, I've said this before, it's really funny, because I could do a so if I'm in a studio, and I'm, you know, in a control, in a booth, and there's like eight people, in the, and I'm doing a guitar solo or whatever, if I play a guitar song and just kill it, and then sit there and go like this, right, they'll be like, yeah, that's okay. Can you do it again? You know, I'm pushing the talk back button down. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, that was great. Let's get another take. I could do the exact note for note, nuance for nuance solo. But if I'm standing up, I go, wow, you know, like put my, get your, you know, stink face on. You know, you gotta learn, you gotta learn the faces, you know, uh, and that helps you. So actually, and there is some truth to that, but um, Paul Anka famously said, people hear what they see. And that's the same thing when you're in the studio and someone's watching you play a guitar solo. If you're really getting into it, they think, oh, this must be a great guitar solo. It could be the worst guitar solo you ever played, but they're going to come away going, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> because they're watching you. They're, they're less hearing and they're seeing. And, and Paul Anka, that's why he always made his band dress up because it was like, you know, you got to wear suits and, we, you know, you got to you gotta tuck in your shirts and wear, the tie has to be right and they have to whatever. Uh, he was kind of a, uh, you know, a Nazi about that kind of stuff. And um, you, I don't know if you've heard the Paul Anka rant. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, this is not for the faint of heart. I think this is it. Let me, I'm... Yeah, I think this is. So, if you've never seen this, this it's pretty funny. But I, I, I interviewed. I, you know, we didn't talk about this in the interview. I should have mentioned this in the interview when I interviewed Joe DeBlasi. Joe used to tour with Paul Anka, and and I think when I think if this is the one, let me see uh, if I can find the the bit here. Hold on a second. 
it's really funny because these band meetings were mandatory, right? And yeah, this is this is for sure the one. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that this is this is the one if you listen to it later. Um, yeah. Oh, Ben, Ben, uh, ben you're 100%, 100% right. Um, uh, Steve Ray Vaughn was really good at that. And, and you know, it, it's like you make a face like something's really pain, you know, because you're putting on a show. I mean, if you played it like, like the exact same intensity and notes and everything and just stood there looking like you're bored, no one's going to pay for that. It's, it's, it's just funny. It's... I hate to say that that's, but it's part of the show. If you're in the studio by yourself, what do you care? But if you're in the studio, I'm not going to put a, you know, stink face on, stank face on when I am playing by myself necessarily. I might, I don't, I'm, I'm not really even conscious of it. I should film myself and see, oh, did I, did I make a face when I played that solo? I mean, you know, because I do get into it. When you're doing a solo, you really do want to, like, again, again, it's all about getting into that zone. And if, man, the greats live in the zone. Steve Ray Vaughan freaking lived in the zone. But when you're live, when you're performing live, you've got, there's like 15 things you've got to do to get yourself in that zone. Um, and unfortunately for some, it was doing drugs. Um, and I think Stevie was a little bit like that at one point, but he cleaned up. Um, but it's also getting your tone that you want. You know, that's what sound checks are for. You know, and if you're the lead artist, Steve Ray Vaughan would, you know, he would say, no, the, your amp's too loud. He goes, I don't care. This is, this is the volume I need to be able to get in my zone. His, he would dress up. Dressing up made him feel like a performer, which helped him get into his zone. If he just wore a t-shirt and jeans, looked like Bruce Springsteen up there, it would be a totally different, you know, it would be a, a whole other thing, but he'd wear the head. And now, to me, having all that stuff dangling off me, I think would be a distraction and would make it difficult to get into the zone. It's one of the things, you remember my video, I, I talk about um, tips for performing live, and that's one of the things. I said, practice standing up. You know, practice creating that live experience. And if you're going to wear 400 scarves hanging off of you and bell bottoms and all, you know, crazy clothes, then you might want to wear that for some of your practice time because, and this could, this applies across the, the spectrum. Uh, you know, if you, if you always pr play, do your tennis, you know, practice in warmups and you're wearing sweatpants and then when it, you go to tennis shorts for the match, you're going to be like, man, my legs are cold. Oh, and you're thinking about your legs instead of your forehand or your backhand or your serve. And uh, so you might want to practice with, in tennis shorts. So it's the same thing with playing the guitar. If you're going to be, you know, dressed up, if you're going to be wearing a suit, uh, very different wearing a suit at a gig than it is, when, you know, and nobody does that. Nobody goes, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, practice all alone in my bedroom and I'm going to go ahead and put on those uncomfortable shoes, um, that, that big bulky coat with the buttons on it, the brass buttons on it and the, you know, the, the khakis or whatever. And, and nobody really ever does that. But when they get to the gig, they're like, not comfortable. Like, man, this is just. I'm like, I had an okay gig. I wish I played better. And it's like, <laughs> it's because you're not in the zone. Steve Tyler wore the scarves. Oh, yeah, see. Yeah, and, and it's the same thing with, you know, and, and again, for for some of it's a psychological thing where you're getting yourself in that headspace. And when you put on that, you know, you put on the armor of being a rock star, you're you're getting ready to go to battle. And, um, and that was Steve Ray Vaughn when he would get those crazy outfits on and, you know, whatever. Um... It was all part of it. So, you, you know, now I think Steven Tyler and C. Ray Vaughn both would walk around dressed that way. Like that was kind of how they dressed all the time. You, you rarely saw either one of them walking around in just jeans and a T-shirt. But I'm sure I'm sure it happened. Prince had a great guitar face. Yeah. Oh, 100 uh, percent. Prince is a great was a great guitar player and uh, had a lot of facility and a lot of different genres and styles he could kind of go in and he was one of those guys that would put a lot of solos on a record even later records uh, so he would he would do a lot of uh, solos and it, it and it's funny because like Purple Rain's a perfect example that's a long guitar solo um, and yet it got on the radio um, 
It, I think it would be difficult today. It's just the radio is so different today than it was back then. Um, and uh, songs are shorter. I mean, I remember that someone did analysis. And it was like, I don't know. I don't remember the numbers, but it took an average of, in the 80s, the average top 10 hit had a 27-second intro or a 42-second intro or something like that. And then, you know, 2022-21, the average intro was... Uh, two and a half seconds <laughs> before lyrics came in, you know, so that, yeah, that, that, in, and, and to be honest, because uh, I work on with these artists that write songs like this, pop artists, uh, to be honest, it puts a lot of pressure on the people writing the melody because you have to come up with a very compelling melody right away. Um, but back in the eighties, what you, what everybody was trying to do was to get people to draw in. They had to come up with a compelling intro, a guitar hook, or a groove or a sonic thing, something happening sonically, whether it be a weird drum thing. You know, when drum machines first hit the scene, uh, you think of um, uh, In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins, you know, the sound that they that they used. It was like, wait, what's, what's that? Prince was really good at that. Um, one of the things I remember about Prince that blew me away was when uh, the song Kiss came out. Kiss. It was... Right around that same time that U2 was really big and um, don't you forget about me, Simple Minds. And the, and everybody was recording in castles and everything had massive amount of reverb and sounded huge. And it sounded, you know, and you're driving in your car and you're listening to these songs and it's just like this huge. And then all of a sudden Kiss comes on and Prince didn't put reverb on anything. Like the drums are dry, the guitar is dry, dig it, dig it. You know, it's like, oh, everybody take a sip. I'm changing guitars. Kiss, right? Everything's really good. And when he does that kiss, you know, and he's singing, you're driving in a car and you just heard Don't You Forget About Me by uh, Simple Minds and then you hear Kiss by Prince and it sounds like Prince is sitting in the passenger seat right next to you singing because a car has no reverb. Like the sound of a car is really short reverb and really dead. And so when Prince came out, it was like, what the heck was, what the heck? It's like, it sounds like, and then that song became a smash. And and then, of course, you know, things went the other way where nobody was putting reverb on anything and making it things. As, well, in the 70s, it was always trying to deaden rooms. Um, you know, you listen to some of the Steely Dan stuff and it's like that snare. It's like, just it's like they got tape on it. They got you know, they baffles everywhere and they're trying to, you know, they put a baffle over that top and they're trying to make sure, you know, that you hear nothing, uh, no reverb at all. And it's like, cause they wanted to add reverb in the studio and control everything. And, and that was a way they did things a lot in the seventies. And then in the eighties, they kind of go, Oh no, we want this natural reverb that happens, you know, organically. And then, you know, and then that was like, okay, we got tired of that. I mean, my band, uh, I told you, my Beth and I had a band. We did three records, uh, two cassettes and a CD. I never released anything on vinyl. But uh, the first two recordings we did, the first two albums we did, were recorded at this uh, youth center for uh, uh, this Baptist church, and um, it had it was a big room, and so the drums, everything, the guitars, the amps, everything uh, had this big sound. Um, and we couldn't, you couldn't de-reverb the tracks. And so that really affected the records. And we, you listen to it, it's like, oh man, that reverb is just like, it's awful reverb. It's just not the, it's not, it's almost like a, it would almost sounded like a gymnasium kind of reverb. Uh, it wasn't quite that bad, but, uh, yeah. Um, so I hope this is interesting. <laughs> But anyway, getting into that zone, and I think that when you're when you're um, st when you start to learn the fretboard, or start to learn and start to learn a little bit of theory, just a little bit, you know, chord theory, I think is really good. So let me let me talk about this. We're in the key of E, all right, and the, and the one chord is major, the four chord is major, and the five chord is major, and we and I on the one chord, I added a two and a three or two and a four and a six, right? So here's the Here's the the four three suspension. Here's the two, or I can do it up here. There, okay. Or I can add the six. Yeah, Santana had. I saw Santana a lot. I saw uh, sitting in the front row of the George Lopez show, and Santana performed. And so I was like, 
as far from Santana as I am from this camera. And oh my gosh, he was so loud. Alex and I were there. It was like, it's funny, too, because uh, the guy, the co comedian warming up the audience thought Alex looked like Justin Bieber. So they had Baby play, and they had Alex get up and sing Baby for the audience. <laughs> he was such a sport. I couldn't believe he did it. So anyway, that four, so the, the, the two, one suspension is also in the A. Now, don't worry, I'm going to, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, but the four... Three, that half step, right? That half step between the, the A and the G sharp that is there, that is the four three suspension in the key of, in the, the key of E is there. And it's also there on the B chord. But over the A chord, that four, that half step suspension of the four to three is out of the key. There is no D in the key of E. E major has E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C sharp, D sharp, D, D sharp as in dog, E. So you can see if I were to do a 4-3 suspension in the key of E over the 4 chord, which is A, <laughs> sorry, won't be a quiz. It should sound like that. Uh, and that's not maybe what you want. You may want this. That's out of key, but it's fine. It gives, it brings in a bluesy sound. It implies the key of A. It, it brings in kind of a, a Rolling Stones, Keith Richards kind of vibe, right? You know, kind of thing. So it's not verboten, verboten, but it it's not in the key. But you'll notice when I was doing that, maybe I went to A. I want to be really pure in the key of E when I get to that four chord I'm gonna to have to and the four chord is built on the fourth degree of the scale the first degree of the scale is E in the key of E then F sharp G sharp and here's A and then if I go I skip a note here I get A and I skip B and go to C sharp I skip D sharp and I go to E there's my triad A C sharp E and that's what makes up this A chord whether you know it or not when you play this A chord, that's what you're playing. You're playing an A, a C sharp, and an E. We have A, E, A, C sharp, E. And that four in the key of, if I were to go up from the F sharp, I'm sorry, from the um, C sharp up to the next tone in the key of A, um, it would be a D sharp. Okay, now that's kind of hard to play. I like to, I kind of like to play it up there. So what I'm doing is I'm playing the open A string, nothing on the bottom string. And then I'm up here at the 7th fret and the 6th fret. And I got that B string open too. So I'm going open, 7, 6, open, open. So that's technically, technically an A2 chord. And then, and then I go, I add that uh, ninth fret on the 3rd string and I get that D sharp. I go to B, and it's already got the D sharp. Okay. Sadie, what's going on? Um, so, no way. Redfin has my house worth a lot more than I think it's worth. <laughs> I'm fine with that, but I'm not selling. I love how they, they send you, oh, your house is worth X amount of dollars. And it's like, really? Well, I could I should sell. And it's like, no, I'm not. if I sell, I have to buy, right? Oh, it sounds like um, not talking about wearing scarves. Uh, Berlin, she wore exactly two red see-through scarves, which stitched together at the waistline and shoulders and a pair of heels. Can't think of the name of the lead. Oh, uh, 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 Terry Nunn. Yeah. I told you the story about when Terry Nunn called me on the phone, right? <laughs> you want to you hear that story? Let me know. Yeah, 
Yeah, so. Yeah, so. But on the A chord, we also have the two. So notice I'm playing A like this so that, that I can have, now I have all these fingers I can use in front of that bar. And the two is the, would be on the third string at the fourth fret. And the six, right there, that's a great, great one, is at the fourth fret of the fourth string. embellishment and that would be more like a fill like I'm using the, the notes the chord tone I'm using the chord tones and scale tones to embellish that A chord so that would be more like a fill oh you don't remember that one And again, that four chord, if there won't be a quiz on this, take a sip. That four chord, if we were to, to play build a scale on that four chord in the key of E, we'd end up with a Lydian scale. So when you play that that sharp four, that uh, instead of being a four three suspension, you got that sharp four, that that D sharp right there. Um, when you play that, you're implying kind of a Lydian sound. And that's, a Lydian sound is very dramatic. Um, film composers use it all the time, right there. It's just a... Yeah, that's a Radiohead song, too, if you do. Start my song on the four chord. Now, also on the A chord, we could go to the the two instead of getting it here. That B note there, we could go open up the second string. Okay, and that does, the two is fairly unique in that regard. So the two could go up to the to the thir three or down to the root. So like, for example, if I were to go that F sharp to the E, right, that, that E2 down to the E, or I could go up to the G sharp, the third. Kind of what you're doing when you're going on the D chord when you go D and you take off your second finger and you open up that E string, okay? And now you're you're taking you're adding the second to the chord. So this is a D two chord. Technically, officially, it's a D two no third. And then you're taking that two up to the three. The two to the three, but I could also take the two down. It's less true with the four. The four. When, when we're talking about that half step where the four is just one fret above the three, and that's in a major D, like for a D major chord. That's D sus or D suspended fourth resolves to D. Now you could resolve, you could resolve it up, but it's not as strong. Like the stronger resolution, the more implied resolution is going down from that. I'm playing a middle two string, I'm playing D string, and a 12th fret. And there's my D sus, and then there's the D major. But I could... Yeah. So, yeah, I could, you know, the four... The four 
could resolve up to the five, but it's more common to go. I went down to the two there. Four, three, two, one. So that could be one, you know, way to, to think about it. Now the six, the six is a whole minor third away from the root. So the six isn't going to go up to the seven. The six go up to a seven like that. Um, I don't wouldn't call that a resolution. I would consider that making creating more tension. Usually when you do create some tension and then a, a, a resolution, um, you're you're going from tension to less tension. So when you go like E to the, add the six, the sus six, and you go to the seventh, now you're creating, I feel like that's more tension. A dominant seventh chord, you're kind of implying this, this tritone thing. That wants to resolve to somewhere, in this case, an A chord. Um, or it doesn't mean you can't go the six to the one. But usually the six wants to go back down to the five. One, six. So we have one, three, five, and then five, six. and roll blues is all about the, the five and six kind of thing uh, old school rock and roll kind of vibe uh, but you know almost sounds like a Paul Simon song or something like that from Graceland okay so uh, quail what did quail say I missed quails oh still here and listening cleaning my studio and changing uh, Changing to two matching monitors for my computer. Well, I have that right now. I, you know, it's I'm not I, I'm, the the for me the studio the monitor having two monitors is still kind of a uh, little bit. Um, I'm a little bit. Um, the jury's still out on it. I wish I had you know because I have my speakers here and my monitors are here so. I don't have room for a third. I almost wish I had a third in the middle that I would spend most of my time looking at. And then I have these, so the side monitors. Um, if I move my speakers, it'd be really hard to move. Everything's all set. It's kind of hard. So, um, so it is a little weird kind of looking back and forth between two speakers. Uh, generally what I do is I put my di my digital, my main um, mix window on the right. And on the left, I'll have like the measure markers, the, the count offs and all that stuff. I'll have the tuner, I'll have the click, and I'll have the interface. All that stuff will be on my left monitor. And usually when I'm playing like this, if I'm playing acoustic, I want to be able to see the tuner, I want to see, be able to see the measure markers because I know, okay, like for example, this phrase right here starts at measure 745. <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh, this piece that I worked on, let's see, had 874 measures. But many rests. You can see a lot of rest in there. Um, typical for game music. It's just one long thing, and then they chop it up, and they use it for different things. Same thing with movies and TV shows. I mean, you'll get... Usually the cues are set up for per section, so the cues, it'll start on measure one, but not always. Sometimes things will start on measure 5,622 or whatever. And uh, so, But anyway, having those measure numbers there moving... The going by is, is uh, oh man, you've been up for seven hours already before you. Yeah, that's funny, Quail. Yeah, I, I know how that is. It's like you want to get it done. Get her done. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, that's what I do. Okay, so the, the Terry Nunn story, the Berlin. Um, when Beth and I first got married, let's see, what was it? Well, no, I think it would have been right around 94 when all our friends started moving to Nashville. It was like the, the pretty much the only 
film composer I worked for, these monitors are not very lined up, but anyway. Um, the, the only composer that I worked for at the time, he and his wife and family were moving to Nashville. And they even asked us, would you come with us? And they, you know, he, he wanted me to come so I could play with him, you know, play for him. And um, they want, Beth was kind of their babysitter. And they said, hey, would you, you know, would you come uh, move to Nashville with us? And I'm like, you know, I'd been in L.A. at that point about 12, 11 years. And I was, I was like, I didn't really ever, I didn't feel established at that point. But I, I knew that if I went to Nashville, it would be like, I might have to wait another 11 years just to get to the point where I'm at now in, in California. And, um, uh, the, uh, Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, my mouse is. Yeah, it's pretty. I have a Mac, so I, I don't know if that changes anything. But yeah, the mouse thing is good. It it goes from one, and I can drag windows over and stuff like that. So, um, oh hey Steve Barry, what's going on? We're gonna studio set up this morning too. An app emulated preamp pedal with speaker emulation for simulator for recording. Nice. Oh yeah, the Sir Ace yeah speaker simulator. That's nice. That's great. Yeah, it's funny because I do all my all my amps and speakers in the in the the, the workstation. Uh, at this point, I mean, I have pedals, I have lots of pedals, but I don't ever pull them out. I have got I know guys that have all their outputs going into, um, you know, like go, have outputs going into a pedal boards, and then they can choose pedal boards and then they go back in. I'm like, yeah, that's that's a lot of. I mean. I don't know that I want to get that started again, the whole pedal, buying pedals, you know, being obsessed with pedals. I can pretty much get any sound I need via, I just kind of tweak things until I find what I'm looking for. But um, yeah, so I was, Beth and I, you know, I, so, so anyway, we had friends who wanted to move to Nash, uh, wanted us to move to Nash. We had a bunch of friends moving there. Buddy Miller was one of them, uh, Buddy and Julie Miller. Um, and he's a great record producer in Nashville. He's been very successful in Nashville. Um, probably never told anybody who lived in California because they, they really, in fact, there's so many Californians moving to Nashville right now of second wave. I think you really almost have to change your plates right away or people are going to vandalize your car because <laughs> they just don't like Californians. And I almost don't blame them. Um, so I, I said, okay, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do Nashville. Maybe let me look at Branson, Missouri, because Believe it or not, in Branson, Missouri, there's something like 35 different music theaters with live shows eight to 10 months a year. And those live shows have bands and that's a full-time gig. Um, you know, you're doing a show every day. And so what I did was I, I, got, I got the Branson phone book. This is before the internet, before Google. I got the Branson phone book and I started writing down a bunch of numbers. Started making calls, started getting numbers for guitar players and music directors and everything like that. See if there was any need for guitar players there. And there were two things. One, every single one of them said, asked me, what's LA like? I really want to move there. <laughs> Grass is always greener, right? <laughs> but that told me maybe I shouldn't leave LA if everybody's wanting to come here. Maybe, you know, I should stick it out. And then the other the other thing that was funny is that they told they told they all told me how bad the traffic was in Branson. And I went, you know, I live in LA, right? And they go, no, you don't understand. There's one road, one two lane road into Brand, work every day and it's packed with buses so it could take us an hour and a half to get to work i'm like you're kidding that is worse than la uh and so i was like okay i ruled that out so then what but what the thing was is that in a month's time i got to know pretty much everybody in branson missouri and i went you know i've never done that in la and so what i started to do was i started to make phone calls and reach out and make demo tapes. And of course, none of that really. In fact, I, it's funny because I actually found out there was a, a composer that I'd sent a demo tape to and my demo tape was awful. And I, I think it, it kept him from hiring me for years because <laughs> he was like, yeah, that was an awful demo tape. I would never hire that guitar player. And then it, we worked together on something and he realized I wasn't that bad. So that's a lesson right there. Um, yeah, guard your brand. I did a video on that, guard your brand. Um, but the, 
the the other thing there was this musicians referral service and it was i forget how much it was it was like two hundred dollars for a year which was a fortune for us but i went ahead and did it and um i put down that i played guitar and that i did write songs which was kind of unusual i think most people just put down they were a guitar player uh but i put both those things down so i would occasionally get some calls from bands and they would be looking for a guitar player or whatever didn't happen very often but i got a call from some some lady and she calls me and says hi my name's terry i'm in a band called billion and uh, i i hear we're looking for a guitar player and i hear you write music too um do you have any songs you can send me and i was like well i got a couple things i can send her i said give me your address and, and um I said, what was the name of your band again? She said, Berlin. And I said, oh, I thought you said Billion. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, I know who you are. And so that was Terry Nunn. And I sent her a cassette tape of like some probably really bad songs. And, um, you know, so I did some cassette to cassette kind of bouncing, mailed it to her, never heard back from them. So <laughs> it was like, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it's funny if I ever, ever, ever meet her again, uh, I doubt she'll remember that interaction, but uh, it, it was funny because I, I, you know, I had no idea who she was at the moment. So uh, Santana reminded me of Allman Brothers only in the sense that he could go on and on and on for days and days, you know, get bored. Yeah, yeah, Allman Brothers, yeah. I was just watching that uh, documentary again um, uh, on Netflix. I'm sorry, not Netflix. Um, if you haven't watched it, it's a great, YouTube has uh, some great free stuff, um, just ads. What's it called? Um, Muscle Shoals. Have you watched the Muscle Shoals documentary? Free with ads. All right. It's just so funny. So often, you know, you think of, you know, some of these great classic soul and R&B tracks being played by a bunch of black musicians. And, like, Respect was a bunch of white rednecks <laughs> from, from, from Alabama. So, you know, songs like that, I mean, you know, When a Man Loves a Woman, that's a, that's a bunch of redneck white guys. <laughs> they, they even called themselves that. It's a great documentary if you haven't watched it, but there it is. Totally recommend it. In fact, I'm going to post it on, uh, I'll post it up on my Facebook. Let's see, this one here. Um, post. They always make it so difficult to post. It's like, okay, where do I post? Why do you make this so difficult? Oh, am I not logged? Oh, I'm not. That's why I can't post. Uh. Now I can post. There we go. So, um, yeah, I love stories like that. Oh, okay, I don't need that. All right. So, um, you know, where you find out the origins of certain things and they're not what you thought they were, which is great. I love that. Yeah, no, it's, 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 and California is one of those things where, you know, oh, you should leave California. Well, the problem with leaving California is you're never going to be able to come back. If you sell, sell your property here, I mean... Uh, if you sell your property, everybody in California is a millionaire, but that's just because their house is worth a million dollars. They're not a practical millionaire. They can't, they can't just go, you know, do whatever they want. A million, million dollars doesn't, <laughs> doesn't buy what it used to. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely, was, took us 32 years to buy a house. So yeah, that's 100% true. Um, Email, oh, so uh, so Sam was saying, uh, was working on Derek Trucks Band's uh, Midnight in Harlem last night. Cool progression. What's the progression? What chords are in the progression? Uh, e major pentatonic. Did I ever record it? Yeah, that's a great documentary too, uh, um, Brad. Um, 
I, I don't, I mean, I watched that documentary and part of me was like, um, part of me was like, I, I'm going to watch this and I'm going to go, oh, wait, I have been there. <clears throat> I don't, not, and keep in mind, I didn't ever do drugs in the 80s or 90s or ever, I never did drugs. So <clears throat> I don't remember, I don't think I've ever been there. It didn't look familiar. Um, the funny thing is I have been to a studio called Sound City, but it wasn't that one. In L and it's it and it was in the same neighborhood too, uh, but it was uh, owned by um, uh, uh, a Latino guy, um, guy from Mexico, and that was where I worked on. I worked on a couple things there. I worked on this band called Grupo de Montes de Durango, and I did a pop version of one of their big hits. And I still make money off that. It's crazy, um, but. Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of the studios I went to, uh, Alpha Studios, A to Z. Um, oh, I spent a lot of time at uh, Martin Sound, um, Evergreen. I don't think any of, Martin Sound still exists, but I don't think Evergreen's still there. I don't think A to Z and Alpha Studios are still there. They may be named different things. The Boom Boom Room. I, the studio I'm at the most now is, because of Bieber, is um, Henson, which is the old A&M Records uh, in, in Hollywood. Um, if I go into the studio, I hardly ever go into the studio, but if I do, and then there's so many little baby studios, a uh, boom, boom room was really more of a vocal studio, like recording vocals and stuff. Boom, boom room was owned by, uh, Will Smith and, um, DJ Jazzy Jeff or whatever. They built, they bought a studio for investment. So, um, uh, <laughs> That's so they can overtax it, yeah. Um, yeah, it was Terry Nunn. It was the singer of Berlin. Now, there was the other band, the other girl group. The, Berlin had big hits. They were, they were pretty big. The other one was Missing Persons, and that was... Uh, the Frank Zappa drummer and his wife were the main two artists for Missing Persons. You know, nobody walks in L.A. That was, uh, I mean, there were there were a lot of L.A. bands as part of that, that new wave movement. Uh, it got pretty big. And then the hair thing happened, the hair band thing happened, and you got a lot of L.A. bands. Uh, Guns N' Roses and... Um, you know, uh, you know, quiet, right? I mean, all those bands were performing at least in Hollywood and they almost all got discovered that record companies were kind of funny that way. It's like when Nirvana got big and they weren't expecting that at all. In fact, that's part of the story of Sound City, the documentary. Let's see if, I think Sound City is one that you, I don't think you can watch free with ads. Let's see if it is. Um, I might watch it again. There's a little bit of Sour Grapes in the Sound City documentary because the owner felt like he was, um, okay, I don't think this is the one. Yeah, oh, it is free with ads. Okay, cool. I may have to add it to my, um, share. So this is the Sound City documentary that, um, that Club B&T was talking about. Also free with ads on YouTube, um, and it's about a studio, and it's it's, it's uh, how many times it almost went belly up, um, and eventually did. But um, that's where I heard the story. I think about the first recording there was the L L Buckingham Knicks record, and they were uh, that was the story. That's where um, I think is that the one, or am I thinking of? There's another studio. Am I, is that right, Brad? Um, Cause there's another studio that actually a friend of mine bought. Oh no, 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 that was, okay. So there's the, the um, there's the classic albums. I think they have almost all of them on um, the Amazon Prime. Classic albums, documentaries, okay. Like they did Steely Dan Asia, which is my really good. It's a great record. Um, oops, Steely Asia, Steely Dan. 
Yeah, so uh, so Sound City was where they, the, like the one of the first recordings. So uh, Mick Fleetwood came in to check out the studio to see if they wanted to record, Fleetwood Mac wanted to record there. And the owner had, like the only thing he had that was recorded in there was the Buckingham Knicks record that they were working on. And they were just living at the studio. Like they they didn't, they were broke and had no money and they were just living in the in like the green room <laughs> sleeping in there, they were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time, and lit, uh, and the owner played the the tracks for the record for Mick Fleetwood so he could hear how the studio sounds because that's a real common thing to do if you're going to check out a studio you want to hear I want what do the drum sounds sound like in this studio whatever, and um, you know what does the equipment sound like, and. He played it for him, and Mick was like, okay, yes, um, who's that guitar player? Um, and he went, well, that's Lindsey Buckingham. And Lindsey and, and uh, Stevie were in the other room, and they could hear their record being played. They're like, why? Why are they playing our record? And so it turns out it was because they were playing it for Mick Fleetwood, and Mick offered Lindsey the job of playing guitar for Fleetwood Mac, and he said, oh, no, I, I would never join Fleetwood Mac unless I could bring Stevie with me. So Stevie's the reason... <laughs> She's still in Fleetwood Mac, but Lindsay's not anymore. But um, not that the, I don't know that they're touring anymore. We'll see now that Christine passed away. I fortunately got to see them a few years ago with the, the, those five members, the original, the main five that everybody knows. Um, and so that was kind of how. So a lot of things happened at Sound City. That was just one of the things. I mean, Rick Springfield came out of that studio and got big, but Nirvana recorded. Uh, um, uh, Teen Spirit, that whole album was recorded there, and the drum sounds are famous. In fact, ultimately, the documentary was done by um, the drummer for Nirvana and um, uh, uh, Dave Grohl, and he ended up buying the the mixing board from there, and that's at his studio now. Um, was it an Eve console? I can't remember. Console, it it's, gets crazy. Yes, <laughs> that's funny. Nico, thank you, Nico. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the Dave Grohl brought the, bought the he it was his documentary. He put it together, I think. And he was the producer anyway. He um Terry Bazio, yes. And Terry Bazio and what was his wife's name, the lead singer? Tony Bazio? No, Ter no, you're thinking you're trying to think of the drummer. Yeah. Terry Bazio, he also amazing drummer. I saw him actually I saw Dweezil Zappa Zappa play Zappa rehearsal. Because the sax player, sax player from our church, plays with Dweezil, and years ago she invited me and Alex to the rehearsal. So I went to the the rehearsal, the studio, and um, Terry Bazio was playing drums. It was pretty amazing. I mean, he had a lot of drums. Oh my gosh, the setup on that must be that's just like that's insanity. Uh, Gosh, I mean, the symbols, you just, God, you Google Terry Bazio's drum kit. It's like, what are you, he had like 15 pedals on the floor. I mean, I don't even know where all these pedals go to. It was unbelievable. But, um, yeah, yeah, Dave bought that studio. And, and the studio, I think, still exists. I think you can still record there, but the, the because the room is largely unchanged, um, Sound City Studios. Yeah. Van Nuys. This is down the street. It's four miles from me. Uh, founded in 1969. Sound City. Yeah, this is their website. Soundcity.la. That's weird. Oh, okay. So they're just they're just selling products now. Yeah. I Sound City today. The studio continues to be family owned and operated with a high speed. Okay. Well, where's the link to the studio then? I see the oh website. Here we go. Oh, no, that's the same website. Home. I guess you just have to call and schedule a session. And these photos now, like, is this the same board they have now? I don't know. I mean, they have those are my Yamahas that they have there in the studio. The same speakers I use. Um. There's Tom Petty. Yeah, Tom Petty recorded there. It's a great documentary. It's worth checking out um, if you haven't watched it already. It's 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 fun. You know, it's one of those documentaries like, oh my gosh, that was done there. That was done there. I mean, the the, the Johnny Cash, 
Although the Johnny Cash record that was done there was, uh, I think, Cash, which is the one that Rick Rubin produced. Fleetwood Mac was recorded there. Both room, both studios were recorded there. Elton John, Tom Petty. Let's see. Um, uh, yeah, it's a really good documentary. It's a, it's a better documentary than... Um, let's go to the Wikipedia page because I'll have a list of the albums. It's not even the artists that recorded there. The artist list is amazing. It's the albums that were recorded there. After the gold rush. Are you kidding me? You know, Buckingham Knicks, Evil Knievel recorded there. That's funny. John Elton John did Caribou, Bachman Turner Overdrive, Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac, Why Can't We Be Friends was recorded there. Niles Lofgren was recorded there. Uh, and then Rick Springfield, even Grateful Dead Ario Speedwagon was recorded there. Cheap Trick, Foreigner, Damn the Torpedoes by Petty was recorded there. I mean, get out of town. Pat Benatar, Crimes of Passion. Her biggest record, it's like, I mean, this is all before the 80s. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch this again. It's just like Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, you know, uh, The Winans, uh, Rage Against the Machine, Nirvana, Nevermind. It's like, are you kidding me? And Tom Petty's great, uh, Rancid, Black Crows, Slayer, it got a lot of metal bands. Kind of slowed down. Weezer did Pinkerton there. It's just like, what a freaking great. I mean, I'll give you the, the Wikipedia page. But I don't think I've ever, <clears throat> I don't think, you know, because I didn't, it sounds like mostly bands there. I, if I were doing sessions, it would have been artists. I would be in a in the studio with an artist because bands already have guitar players. Um, or I'd be there doing a TV show or movie thing, but those don't really happen like that anymore. They did when I first moved here, but I wasn't doing that kind of work when I first moved here. I wanted to do that kind of work when I first moved here but I wasn't able to. So um, anyway, that's Oh, okay, Eric's guitar repairs in that. Oh yeah, Eric. Oh, that's right. That's where um that's Eric is where um I think Alex has taken his guitar, some guitars to Eric. I think Eric's is more expensive than William. I think you're I think uh, <laughs> Brad, I think Alex recommended William to you. I got to I just bought a new guitar and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have William set it up because it's. But we're, we're Alex and I'll work on it first, um, and then my my requinto where the bridge came off right there you can see it in the corner, um, over here right there that thing the bridge came off, and so William's gonna put that back together. Yeah, so Eric's over there. I didn't know that. I didn't realize. Um, yeah, it's. Yeah, Sound City. Well, let's see. What, what's the most recent stuff that's been there? I mean, I, you know, System of a Down. That's crazy. was recorded there. Um, oh, Cold War Kids. Okay. Elvis Costello did it, something in 2008 there. 2022, Jack Johnson. Marcus Mumford. Mar Mumford recorded there. Switch, Switchfoot. Dylan. Wow. In 2020. The Killers. Phoebe Bridgers. Phoebe Bridgers is a really cool artist. Andrew Bird, cool artist. Um, Crystal Method. So the, and that's all in the last four years. So yeah, so it's, it's still bands. The bands are still recording over there. That's cool. I mean, I think there's a certain mojo there that it just. I don't know if it's real. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Dis, I'm not gonna dismiss mojo as not being a thing. But uh, but there is psychological mojo where you go someplace that's like really. Oh my gosh, I can't believe. You know, when I went to Abbey Road Studio Two and I'm in the room, I got chills because. I knew I was in the room that all the Beatle records were made. So, um, yes, Catherine, uh, do that. Just do note cards, you know, and then shuffle them and do them in a different order the next day. Try to do that every day. I mean, like I said, it may be a, a uh, yeah, it could be a 20 minute commitment the, at first. Uh, but, you know, eventually, you know, when you're trying to find those C notes, you'd be like, uh, okay, E, F, G, A, B, C, okay, A, B, C, okay, D, O, D, C, um, but then, then you, then you're like, you know, you're going to be that fast, you're going to be able to find the C's, um, but the other thing you can do too, Catherine, is you can just play a chord, like here, that chord right there, and you're like, okay, you may not even know what that chord is, but you can go, 
Okay, that's a E. Yeah, that's a B. Okay, this is a a G flat or or an F sharp. You know, it's hard sometimes. You don't like it. It says it G flat or F sharp. Well, if this is a B. This is probably gonna be an F sharp. And then we have A and D and F sharp and B. You can analyze. Okay, okay. So I have a B. You write down B, and I have another B. Okay, I don't need to write that down again. I have a an F sharp. Okay, write that down. Okay, I have a A. All right, that's weird. And then I, I have a D. Okay, and I have another F sharp, so I don't need to write that down. So you got four notes. I got B, F sharp, A, and D. We'll put them in order. B, D, F sharp, A. That's a B minor seven arpeggio. Or a B minor seven chord. So that's a B minor seven chord. So that's another way that you can, there's a, there's a benefit to knowing the fretboard. Uh, but there's another way you can learn the fretboard by just playing a random chord up the fretboard and going, what notes are in there? You can even just take an open chord, like, you know, like if you want to take the E chord. You go, well, why does that work? That works. Why does that work? And then you go, okay, we analyze it. Okay, well, that's E. Oh, that's another E. Oh, that's an A. C sharp. Oh, A, C sharp, E. Oh, that's an A chord. Oh, that's the four chord. Well, no wonder that works. Okay, and you go up here and... Oh, that's the five chord. You know, that kind of stuff. You, 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 can, you can come at that knowledge from different directions, right? That's what I always talk about, how we all have different ways of learning. And trust me, my way of learning is not memorizing things. That's why I didn't do well in school. But I did, mem you know, I've, there are times you have to memorize your addition tables and your multiplication tables and things like that. You just have, I have to do it probably twice as long as the average person. Um, and same thing with that fretboard. I didn't have a problem memorizing it, it once I committed myself to it. But there's different ways that you can you can come at those notes, different ways that can be re reinforced as you start. Like I said, if you're not going to use it, you're probably going to lose it. If you're not playing up the fretboard or thinking about some of those notes. Oh, yeah, I used to go to West L.A. Music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Quail, and it's funny because, sorry, I, I'm, it's Squirrel. Um, <laughs> but anyway, about the yeah, the learning the fretboard. I'm glad you're you're gonna try to do that. That's a good good um, thing to try to do. Sorry, just stretching out my sleeves. They're short. Um, yeah, West Valley music. You know the thing about West West Valley music in so many of the stores, even Guitar Center in Hollywood and all that, um, was that for years and years and years, I was so poor, it was just depressing to go into those stores. I mean, I couldn't afford anything. I just, it just was not, I was like, oh man, I want that guitar, but I can never afford it in a million years. Give me the cheap, 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 triple treat cheap version of that guitar. Um, you know, now I could, you know, now it's like I go into a store and it's like, it doesn't have that awe and wonder anymore. That's all gone. And I could buy yeah, pretty much any guitar I see, I could buy if I really wanted it. But that whole gearless thing, eh, yeah. <laughs> you know you know me, I mean, I'm, I'm like happy with a $100 Squire. I'll, I'll write a pop song with that. Um, I don't need like to have a, a 59 Strat anymore, you know. I, I would like it, it would be nice, but I, I, I'd be, a, I'd have to pay, I'd hate paying the insurance on it. Uh, you got to look at about 1.25% for insurance on gear. So if you have $100,000 worth of gear, you're, you're, you're writing a check for $1,250 every year to insure it. Um, so if you buy a $60,000 guitar <laughs> just for that guitar, you're shelling out like $700 a year in $750 a year in insurance just to for the privilege of owning it. I mean, you don't have to insure it, but something happens to it gone so yeah I, I I'm kind of not that I'm lightening my load I just I'm buying stuff all the time but I'm always buying things I don't have um, I bought an electric a new electric um, and I bought a, a, a um, bought a fender um, Jaguar so I like because I like that the white um, base six I like the electronics on that and so this thing's really cool I've already recorded a track with it um, that I really like so, do I like blackberry smoke? Um, do I dare Google that? <laughs> I don't know who blackberry smoke is. Uh, let me see if I can see what it is before hitting search. 
Oh, tour. Okay, it's a band. I've never heard of them. Sorry. Uh, looks cool, though. Kind of. Looks like. Are they kind of like a, a Black Rebel Motorcycle Club or a. a yeah, they're touring a lot. They, yeah. Um, or. Um, Grateful Dead, is that the kind of vibe for Blackberry Smoke? Never heard of them. Cool, though. Uh, it says they recorded at the RCA Victor Recording Studios. Um, is that... Let me, let, me, let me do this again. Hold on one second. Let me go to their Wikipedia page. I can tell more, like, from who worked with them or whatever, you know. Here we go. American rock band. Well, they don't look like young kids. Benji Shanks. That name sounds familiar. Huh. Whipper whip, whip will. Oh, the, okay. No. Let's see who produced them. I mean, not a lot of sales, but sales is a totally different thing now. It's like hard. It's it's where does it go? So they're kind of a USA Americana thing. Now their last record, here you hear Georgia went number one on US Americana, but I don't know what that means. So, the, okay. Listen to Run Away From It All. Okay, I can't, I, I will. I'll, I'll pull that up right now on YouTube, but I can't listen to it now because I don't want it going through the speakers and then having a copyright strike, okay? Does that make sense? Um, but I'll pull it up and let's do it. Looks like the kind of band I would like. I mean, so the funny thing is, is um, Smoke. Pretty little lie. Which, which song did you say? Run away from it all. Okay, that's not coming up here. There it is. All right. Um, now, my friend mixed a record by a band that was... They're American band, that, but they're fairly big in Europe. I wonder. And that's the funny thing is, like, Europe loves music. <laughs> they just, they just, like, all the all the good American bands spend so much time, and jazz musicians spend so much time in Europe because they just, they they get it, you know. They understand music. So, um, Yaloko, you know, this, you're not Jeff Frickman, are you? <laughs> Is that Jeff? Uh, I think Jeff would have been, uh, he would have had his name in there. But Jeff is my friend. He mixed a record. He went to Europe and mixed a, an American band. And it, it was kind of Americana, rock, blues. Really good band. And Jeff's a great mixer. And um, I can't think of the name of the band, though. But Jeff, if you're watching, Jeff just had um, shoulder, you know, he had rotator cuff surgery. So he's not working he has to take six weeks off let it drag and then he starts rehab it's like oh gosh i mean there's only so much so many netflix documentaries you can watch in six weeks it's like holy cow um so let's see what time is it oh my gosh it's been two hours all right i need to get going i've got work i gotta do but solid solid over 30 the whole time here you know, we, t we hit 40 once. I oh, 44. Wow. All right. Well, I'm a, you know, not a new record, but dang, nice. Solid 30, 30 times here. Uh, check out all my videos. You know, if you're new to the channel, if you just happen to see me, I've got lots of videos up there. Not uh, not live videos. I, have, I mean, I have those too, but I have lots of subjects. And I'm, I've, I do have another Dad Gad video that I'm going to release. Um, uh, I almost did an unboxing video for the Jaguar. I started filming it, and then when I got the guitar out of the case, it was like, 
it was like causing problems. It was having problems right off the bat. And I was like, oh, shoot. And I looked at the neck and it was straight. And I'm like, I got to take the neck off and adjust and all. So it was like I stopped filming and it's like, OK, forget it. I'm not going to do <laughs> I'm not going to do an unboxing. Um, so uh, but. Uh, oh, let's see. Um, but next, uh, so I don't know if I'll do a video this week, a new video. I mean, it's been a while since I've done a video. I got to find something to do. Oh, but oh, who was the artist we were talking about that I thought I could do maybe a, a favorite grooves of? Oh, uh, Willie Nelson. Let me do a little research and see if Willie Nelson has... Um, oh, go to YouTube. Uh, I'm going to watch Willie Nelson live for a bit. See if he has a groove that he kind of gravitates to, towards. Oops. All right. So, um, so the, I, I will, if I can come up with a, a, a groove, you know, if he, if there's a groove that he really likes and I can do a video for that, would be kind of fun. Cause I'd love to do another one of those videos. I really like it cause they're really geared towards beginners, but it's also, on my end, it's a little bit more like investigative journalism. <laughs> so it's it's kind of fun. Um, walking in L.A., yeah, Missing Persons, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, that era of music was really quirky and fun. And and I really felt like in the 80s, eh, still, I pop with pop music, I still say this, kind of anything goes. You never know what's going to be a hit and what genre of music you can quote or steal from and come up with a an idea that will catch people's ears and go, wow, that's cool. Um, still being done, uh, but back in the 80s, it was like, yeah, you know, things had a certain pace to them. Oh, what are the cards you you sell these? Oh, no, no, Todd, no, I, I should, yeah, I, that would be, Todd, it's super easy. So do you have, if you have note cards for like school, like three by five cards, heck, like I said, you can take a piece of paper and just cut it up in little pieces. Write all 17 possible note combinations down, and you're going, 17? I thought there were 12. It's like, no, you could do A, A sharp, B flat, uh, B, C, C sharp, D flat, D, etc. Okay? Um, so you write all those down on a piece on little cards and then just shuffle the deck and then open it up. Yeah, Bo Diddley would be a good one. I, I've thought about that. Um, I have to do some research on that to make sure that that's, I always think of it as the Bo Diddley groove um, and other people have other names for it, but I'm Bo Diddley and this is my song. You know, I always just think that. Um, so Bo Diddley would be a good groove. Actually, that's a good groove to learn anyway. I should just say do the Bo Diddley groove and not say this is his favorite groove. I mean, I w if it was a Tom Straley groove, I'd probably do it all the time. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, let me do a little research on this and see if I can come up with something. Yeah, Todd. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I'd, I'd love to sell you. You know, I, yes, I have them, and they're fifty nine ninety five. <laughs> I'm not gonna make any money off you. I don't want to do that. I mean, I make three dollars for doing these live streams, right? So it's not like you know, I'm not obviously not the, here for the money. I'm here for the adoration. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Uh, but yeah, Todd, Todd, learn that fretboard. Do it, do it. You can do it. But again, you're going to have to use it. Now, the question is, if you learn it, will you use it more? And then ultimately, you'll you'll retain it. And that's great. Um, and again, if you're already playing up the fretboard, if you're playing guitar licks or whatever, and I don't want it to get to the point where you're thinking about every note you're playing. No, you're totally fine to learn scales and then just memorize those scales and be wrote with them. Wrote meaning you just have them under your fingers so you don't have to think about them, right? And that becomes, because let me put it this way. I don't think about every letter that's in every word I'm saying. I don't even think about every word I'm saying most of the time, sadly. And so that's, you know, obviously you don't sit down and go, okay, oh wait, there's an example. Today, T-O-D-A-Y, no, you don't do that. You just say today. Um, and so that's how you want to get on the guitar. You don't want to necessarily go, okay, E, G, A, B, D, E, you know, E minor pentatonic. You know. No, you learn it. You learn the notes in it because that could be handy because if you learn that, you go, okay, oh, that note's cool. What is that? Oh, that's a flat five. Well, I wonder where else the flat five is cool. 
okay? So if you start to associate some, some music theory knowledge and some number things or some note things, to, you can, you can cross-pollinate all your information, your knowledge, and that's, that's when it gets really fun. And then again, it's uh, when I'm soloing, I'm just soloing, I'm just going for it. I'm, and we talked about this earlier, I try to get into that zone. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, when your wife tells you about words, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but, um, you, you know, we, you get to that zone where you're just going, you're, you're, you're in there, you're just there, you know, and it's, it's probably a lot like a comedian when the comedian's in the middle of their routine, you know, and they're just in the zone and people are laughing and they're going and they got the next idea and the next thing. And generally comedians memorize their routines, uh, but not always. Certain ones that certainly didn't. And they do variations on the theme or they, but anyway, I don't need to go into that. Okay. That's for the autograph set. Of <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cards. Yes. Bruce, yeah, I could, I could totally have those manufactured, and then I, I could, you know, the notes on the neck cards. And basically, what you do is you just bite C, and you try to find a C on all six strings, and then you pull up a next card that says E flat, and try to find an E flat on all six strings, and you just work your way down the strings, low to high if you want, or high to low, it doesn't matter. Um, and then, but I would do it in order, okay? Um, I would do the strings in order. Um, again, I'm not afraid of shortcuts, but the problem was that you go, okay, so here's C. Oh, I know if that's C, this is C. Yeah, you could do that. But if you go in order, your hand's going to be moving up and down the fretboard. You're going to be going all over the fretboard, which means it's going to, I think it's going to sink in a little better. You can notice, like you can come back to that. You go, okay, C, C, C. Oh, okay. This one's C because of this one. Um, and then this C and then this C, whatever. Um, you can start to see patterns and that's totally fun. But I would still go in order of the strings on a daily basis until you've got it down, until you don't have to think about it anymore. It may be every day for a year. I don't know. But again, it's going to take you, it may take you a half hour the first day, but by the end, it may take you two minutes to go through all, all eight, 17 cards. It may not take any time at all. Um, and that will really open up the fretboard for you. You'll, you'll be able to, again, you'll be able to um, reverse engineer things. You can look at a scale and go, okay, what notes are there? Oh, well, these notes are in it. Rather than going, oh, let me find this scale on the fretboard. Go, you know, you can do reverse engineering and forward engineering too. So anyway, all right. Uh, but that's not all. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. Uh, yeah, no worries. I'll go into pot with Willie Nelson. Okay, I, yeah, I'll check out. I'm going to check out, Joseph. I'm going to check out some Willie Nelson tracks. Um Oh, hey, John Swanson. Thanks. I hope so. I hope you learned a lot. I don't know. I'm just riffing here. I'm trying to be in the zone <laughs> as a teacher. The teacher zone. Scott Johnson, good to see you from Boulder, Colorado, where we are all <laughs> zoning out. I've been to Boulder. I love Boulder. Boulder's got great restaurants. I almost took a job just in, in, in Boulder, actually. The job was in Boulder. I almost took a church job there leading worship back in 2003, 2004. Uh, I forget the name of the church, but I, I'm glad I didn't take it. I found out later it was it would have been a a complete mess. But my friend um, John, um, John, 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 what's John's last name? Now, John lives in the East Coast now. He lived in Denver his whole life, but he's the one that kind of recommended me the church. Anyway, um, I will I will end the stream now, and God bless you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I, I will try to get this next dad get. I'm almost done with it. I've done all the diagrams. I've I, I think I'm almost done with it. I just got to bounce it up and 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 do the tags and all that stuff. So I'll do the another. It's another jazzy dad gad video, which I don't think that one. Let me see how where we're at with that one. You just never know with these. Sometimes the first one's a dud, and the second one's like, whoa, what happened? Why did it take off like that? Um, no, no, no. Let's see. I need to open. Uh, was it the last video I did or some jazz code? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm at 1200 views. That's not very many. Um, yeah, I did a one for tips for playing over two, five, one progressions. I was going to do a bunch of little lessons on that, but it didn't really go anywhere. Um, yeah. In fact, I've got, I probably got some comments to moderate held for a review. Oh, shoot. Yeah. 
yeah, there's, I got to approve a bunch of comments. So I know I've got that window open too. So I got my work cut out for me when we, we sign off here. Okay. You guys are putting me to, to work anyway. And I also got, I'm actually got, I'm caught up on one of the video games. I've got to write some music for this TV show, but um, I'm going to work on that later today. So talk to you soon. Bye.